if you can't change, that's not that easy to do evolutionarily to some other way of coping with the environment, you're going to go extinct. And that's really been the most species that have ever lived are extinct in the history of life. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. On this episode, I'm continuing in my series on creationism and evolution. And in this episode, you're in for a treat. I've managed to score an interview with a special guest, a celebrity in the field of evolutionary biology. So sit back and enjoy. As always, if you enjoy this content, please hit like on your podcast app. Please share it with your friends and come visit my webpage at www.therationalview.ca. Dr. Niles Eldridge has been a paleontologist on the curatorial staff of the American Museum of Natural History since 1969. His early work focused on the evolution of trilobites, a group of extinct arthropods that lived between 535 and 245 million years ago. Eldridge is also the curator responsible for the content of the major exhibition Darwin, which opened in New York, London, Rome, and Lisbon in time to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth in February 2009. His book Darwin, Discovering the Tree of Life, accompanied the expedition, exhibition. Eldridge's main professional passion has always been evolution. Throughout his career, he's used repeated patterns in the history of life to refine ideas on how the evolutionary process actually works. His theory of punctuated equilibria developed with Stephen Jay Gould in 1972 was an early milestone. Eldridge went on to develop a hierarchical vision of evolutionary and ecological systems, and in his book, The Pattern of Evolution, he has developed a comprehensive theory, the sloshing bucket, that specifies in detail how environmental change governs the evolutionary process. Other works include Unfinished Synthesis and Eternal Ephemera. A critic of gene-centered theories of evolution, Eldritch's Why We Do It in 2004 presented an alternative account to the gene-based notions of evolutionary psychology to explain why human beings behave as they do. Concerned with the rapid destruction of many of the world's habitats and species, Eldritch was curator-in-chief of the American Museum's Hall of Biodiversity in 1998 and has written several books on the subject, most recently, Life in the Balance. He has also combated the creationist movement through lectures, articles, and books, including The Triumph of Evolution and The Failure of Creationism from 2000. Eldritch, who is also an amateur jazz trumpeter, an avid collector of 19th century cornets, lives with his wife, his dog and cat, and 500 cornets in Ridgewood, New Jersey, but repairs to the Adirondack Mountains to hike, think, and write as often as possible. He is currently writing Gaian Homilies, an account of ex- his experiences witnessing the nature of Gaia and the negligent Gaia side committed by homo-, homo sapiens. Dr. Eldritch, welcome to The Rational View. Thanks. It's good to be here, Al. Thanks for asking me. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited to have you on the show. Your your tireless work in support of spreading a rational view of evolution is much appreciated <laughs> yeah. by those of us in the rational side of this argument. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe uh, start with a bit of a, a background, because uh, obviously not all our listeners are expert biologists. Darwin's origin of the species was a groundbreaking theory, and it provided a coherent explanation of the biodiversity that he observed in nature. He didn't know about DNA and the abundant evidence in the genome for common descent. Uh, The fossil record 200 years ago was quite spotty. What observations was he basing his theory on? Well, actually, Darwin remains a hero of mine, even though we were considered to be uh, critics of his of his work, we were we corrected one thing that he actually had caught sight of, but uh, couldn't find the evidence uh, 
to convince himself to pursue it. So he pursued uh, a more traditional, even by that time, more traditional view of gradualism. He went out on the Beagle from 1831 to 1836. And that he had been schooled as a medical student, a very bad medical student, because he was much more interested in natural history. Uh, when he was 16, I guess, he went He went to Edinburgh and spent two years there. And he learned about evolution there from two of the faculty members, his own grandfather, for that matter. He, he, he learned about evolution before the theory of... Oh, absolutely. His grandfather, uh, Erasmus, had written a book that's full of evolutionary stuff. He was a medical doctor, too, also had gone to Edinburgh. But um, I think evolution as a sort of a professional occupation of academic life starts, in my mind, around 1801 in Paris with Lamarck. I mean, he, mm. Lamarck, uh, we, we mock uh, Lamarck out but he was a hero to Darwin. Lamarck thought that 3% of the fossils that he found uh, in the rocks around Paris, in the Paris Basin limestones, were still alive in the coasts, uh, coastal waters, marine waters, mm. uh, off the coast of France. And so what happened, the question was, what happened to the other ones? And he felt that they had must have transformed, that was the word that they used, into the living species that we do see uh, today. And all but three of them, uh, 3% of them changed. The uh, the 3% remained uh, recognizably the same. They were very simple shells, and who knows if they really were still the same species. I see. So he painted a picture of gradual change through time, even though he didn't have any intermediates to sort of support that, uh, that rule. So by the time Darwin, in the 1820s, we're talking to, now got to medical school, the naturalists, it was an open secret that life had evolved. And uh, uh, naturalists were beginning to talk about the replacement of species, uh, things in the fossil record replaced by living ones, for example. And what Darwin actually added to the mix while he was on the Beagle was that uh, species replaced one another, very closely related species replaced one another in space as well geographically. So you get closely related species living in different habitats. Okay. And he amassed a huge amount of, of evidence for that. And that's what he found, of course, in the Galapagos, amongst other amongst other things. So there was a lot of evidence and it was very much a sort of a Edinburgh was considered to be the hotbed of intellectual life in Great Britain at those in, in those early decades of the nineteenth century. Interesting. Yeah. That was the hot place. And they were very much in touch with what was going on on the continent in Germany and in Italy. Uh, uh, John Battista Barocchi was another very uh, careful thinker. And, and of course, in Paris, where Cuvier, who never allied himself with the notion of evolution, probably for religious reasons, but nonetheless felt that everything in the fossil record was extinct. And there must have been waves of extinction engulfing uh, the creatures of the earth and new uh, species were created to take their place. And he was a scientist, full out, and there's, a, there's some reason to speculate that he harbored a, uh, a scientific, that is to say, a natural view of how those species came about. He never discussed how that replacement took place. I see. But Lamarck did, and Lamarck felt that there was a transformation. He, so he, he was a colleague of, of Cuvier's and they were famous for not agreeing about much of anything <laughs> at all. So, uh, <laughs> so, so Lamarck didn't think extinction happened. He thought rather that transformation happened. Anyway, Darwin read all of this stuff. Um, there's, there's a monograph on these shells that Lamarck wrote in 1801. So I traced the beginnings to there. It might have even be traceable further back. Mm. The word fossil was coined by Lamarck in the 1801 uh, monograph. So, so this kid goes out, and he's—I think—he's imbued with this evolutionary theory. He goes to—he goes to Cambridge after he basically flunks out of medical school for inattention, not because he wasn't smart enough. And uh, his father said, "Well, you still need a job. You still need a uh, a calling. Mm -hmm. So you're going to become a clergyman," he said. And he sends them to uh, to Cambridge where Darwin is supposedly getting an undergraduate degree, but he is actually working with uh, the naturalist there. Hmm. Uh, Adam Sedgwick was a geologist. He took him out in the field in Wales and taught him the ropes. Of, uh, he's a quick student, too. And in less than a week, week uh, he learned how to map 
geological rock, rocks and, and, and collect stuff and, and everything. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Henslow, the, the botanist there, he took his course three times. And Henslow was, uh, it was a creationist. He was not into evolution. The, the, this hotbed of radical thinking had not reached uh, the very conservative Cambridge uh, at that point. Uh, but nonetheless, Henslow was was uh, obsessed with variation in plants within species, uh, even within a local population, but even across England, the same species, but it's different. And he taught uh, Darwin how to make uh, museum collections and make uh, these herbarium uh, uh, pastings of uh, in, in, into folios uh, to keep preserved plants. And he saw the he saw these patterns. So anyway, he was hot to go. He always had wanted to go see tropical forests. And uh, um, uh, so when he got the offer to be the informal ship's naturalist and companion to the captain on, on the Beagle, he jumped at it. And of course he did. And, and it, it, it was supposed to go around the world and take a year. And it took five years. They eventually did go around the world. But their main remit was to map the more carefully the... Uh, the waters uh, off the coast of southern South America. Wow. Because the, things were heating up. That's where they, what the Brits call Falkland Islands, what the uh, Hispanic people call Malvinas Islands. Mm-hmm. They're still fighting over that. So, Indeed. And there was a lot of commerce, world commerce, because they had to go around uh, the bottom. There was no Panama Canal or anything. So uh, the shipping industry was, was depending on accurate coastal maps. So, on. so that's what the remit of the Beagle was. And uh, Darwin was supposed to just be, be a pal to the captain and see what he could see. Spent much, much of his time on the land because he, uh, he got seasick horribly. And so. The reason I'm, I'm, I'm digging into, you know, what were the observations uh, that, um, you know, basically uh, brought about the theory of evolution or, or inspired uh Darwin to come up with this theory is that oftentimes um, you hear we get this controversy in in the evolution versus creationism where anti-evolutionists get hung up on the word theory of evolution as though it's all just a guess you know we don't know what it is but usually when I'm talking I try to distinguish between the fact of descent with modification or the observation that requires a theory to describe it so there's a there's a fact uh, that's based on a lot of observations and and back in the 19th century you know they were just learning how the 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 age of the earth from from the geological sciences uh, that allowed for uh, common descent to occur because you know before they knew that the earth was this old they didn't you know <clears throat> a common descent theory probably wouldn't have worked so a lot of things came together to uh, allow or to, to drive this interpretation of the evidence. Uh, and then there's the theory of natural selection that explains the fact. Oh, and a good deal more than just natural selection, yes. But that's the central uh, aspect. Yeah, well, the theory of evolution, um, it is a hypothesis that life has evolved. But uh, you, there, there's a pattern of resemblance that, that was known all the way back to... Uh, Certainly in Linnaeus, but the Greeks saw it, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. There's a pattern of resemblance that links up all living things. And the more detail you get right down to the DNA, which, as you say, didn't come along for another century and a half or so after Darwin. But uh, um, it, any aspect of it, there's a pattern. Any aspect of the an- anatomical or, uh, features of organisms. Are sort of radiate out in, in concentric circles, like you and I as human beings resemble chimpanzees more than we resemble sponges. But if if uh, sponges have cellular structures and so forth, even though they don't have organ systems, they're very primitive. They are animals. They have animal cells, hmm. in them, mm-hmm. eukaryotic animal cells. And so, how do you explain that? You can either explain it by uh, folkloric wisdom. Religious uh, things that this is the way God made things. This is what was uh, the inherited sort of uh, intellectual even, um, but certainly uh, the reigning idea about why this resemblance of uh, linking up all organisms on the face of the earth. But 
you got to remember that at this point, uh, around uh, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, Isaac Newton had said, basically, Isaac Newton was a deeply religious person, but Isaac Newton said that anything that we can observe in nature happening uh, or, or patterns or things that we observe, like apples falling or something like that, I don't know if he actually used the apples himself, um, uh, has a natural expl explanation. It doesn't have a supernatural explanation. And people were bitten by that, smitten by that. They, uh, in, in the uh, academic centers, the museums and, and the uh, universities, the medical schools and colleges hmm. um, in, in Great Britain, they, they thought that that was a very wise and, and, of course, made a lot of sense. And so there's much in science, like the water going over a waterfall, falling through gravity, and, and the observation on the solar system, and so on and so forth. So organisms are natural beings they and they they have births histories and deaths mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. uh, there's a natural explanation for their births histories and deaths however much you want to say that god made you but the people were quite aware of the facts of life in terms of and so were the farmers going back to the time genesis was written they knew that uh that this reproduction occurs and it's a natural thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was a simple thing to, uh, to extend that thinking to the reproductive and the, uh, account for the similarity of things, not just between parents and their offspring, but account for it in a general sort of way about uh, between things that seem to be different species, different reproductive communities. And that was a hypothesis. It still is. There, there is no better one. That that involves natural causation. That's what it is. But you know, it's there are plenty of facts that support it. And the more you dig, like you come along a century or so later and discover DNA and find out that well, it's actually RNA that absolutely is in every living thing, including viruses, which many people think are technically not alive. I, I happen to disagree, but um, um, mm -hmm. all life has RNA in it, and most life has DNA. In it. And that's what you would have predicted from, uh, fr from the experience that people had just looking at, I don't know, patterns of fingers on hands and, and hair on heads and, and so forth. And fossils. The kind of, yeah, and fossils. That would be the other big thing. You would expect that the, that the earliest fossils would be simpler than the, uh, the later ones. And they are. And people realize that if you want to understand the origins of modern species, Mollusks are great, but human beings are not bad, too. We have an intensely studied fossil record. It's not a bad fossil record at all. And the, and the younger and sort of on top of the pile of rocks where the fossils are, you get the younger, more recent uh, examples belonging to these lineages. And if you look at human evolution, they get more and more and more like us until, bingo, they're us. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what you would predict. And again, that wasn't known when Darwin was working. I think the first fossil hominid that anybody paid attention to was probably the Gibraltar skull. Um, it was a Neanderthal, and that caused a, a great. And, and Darwin was saying, "Yeah, you know, you would expect to find these kinds of things uh, that that are older." So, your early work, um, <clears throat> looking at trilobites, um, basically um, drove you to. <clears throat> generate the theory of punctuated equilibrium as uh, maybe an alternate uh, theory of natural selection or an alternate theory uh, describing evolution. Not, not to natural selection, but, but we were trained to believe, as Darwin left us in 1859, when he finally had the courage to publish his ideas, because as a kid, he, we're talking 1820s and 1830s. It was the 1830s he was on the Beagle. He came back. And he wrote up a bunch of notebooks that had all the goodies in it. But it took him 20 years, I think, to summon the courage, given the climate that he was living in, to actually publish it. Hmm. Yes, and he left us with an expectation that basically life evolves gradually through time. So that if you have uh, a nice exposure of rock or, or, or a series of adjacent exposures, that tell a story through time, as Darwin learned how to map in Wales when he was there with Sedgwick before he even went on the Beagle, you would expect to find a change uh, from the 
no matter how spotty the record was, wherever you get the fossils, they should be changing as you go up and get into younger rocks. Mm -hmm. And um, that would be the uh, that would be the uh, the prediction that that uh, he made. He said uh, it's strange in his notebooks in the late 1830s. Uh, he acknowledged that there wasn't a great deal of evidence in the fossil record as it was studied up to that point. He said maybe Mr. Lonsdale, who worked on older Paleozoic things like I did, but but brachiopods and mollusks, will surely have found some examples. Well, Mr. Lonsdale never found any examples because things do not evolve in that gradual sort of way persistently through time. What I discovered uh, was that uh, things evolved basically geographically when there was upsets in the environment and uh, my seas waxed and waned over the continental interior. I was in Canada uh, too. The, the, my, my sediments outcropped in Western Ontario as well. Some of the most beautiful things. Uh, oh, neat. I've seen what, what area? the Arcona Shale. Arcona Shale, Bedford. Okay. Nice. Yeah, and basically they relate very well to what's in Michigan and what's in Ohio and the same basic kinds of things. But they are spectacularly beautiful. I commend them to you. They're a, they're a nat natural treasure. So anyway, we had changes in the environment. There was a waxing and waning of the seas as the seas withdrew. Uh, what people don't understand is that most of the history of North America, we were underwater. We were under marine waters with exuberant marine life in them. Uh, and they make wonderful fossils, particularly out in central part of the continent where uh, the rocks are still flat lying and they haven't been disturbed. They haven't been messed up too much. And uh, they're often opened uh, as quarries for limestone, for building purposes and for whatever other purposes people are using the rocks. And that allows you to get down below the farmland and below the glacial till. And, and get down into the rocks themselves and collect these wonderful things. But as you go through time in any one place, or even through time in general, where these rocks are exposed, this I'm talking about the Middle Devonian, I should be clear about this, 380 million years ago. But it was an interval of time that wasn't just 380 million years ago. It was maybe, I don't know, exactly when it started uh, 378 million to 383, but anyway, five or six million year period of time. So these trilobites are complicated organisms. They preserve beautifully. And um, I expected to be able to find some evolution in some of this complex anatomy, given that amount of time, but also given the space, because the seas waxed and waned as far west as Iowa and as far east as the Hudson Valley of New York is where it's preserved now. And all the way down the Appalachians. And what happened is these things came in. There was a collision between uh, what's now Africa and, and continental Europe and what is now North America. And we got a lot of the creatures that were living in uh, those regions in slightly older times invaded us because they became, we, we were sutured together and the seas were together and they, uh, they came in. And we could we could see that, and as soon as this lineage of trilobites that I was working on got here, some of them went further west into the limier, shallow, uh, warmer, presumably tropical seas uh, of what is now the American Midwest, North American Central area, and uh, immediate that they were the old ones, the original ones, the ones that were in the muddy environments, uh, which were now exposed in New York and Pennsylvania and places like that, quickly changed. They coin change rapidly. I, there's one quarry in upstate New York where I swear I've got some things that are intermediate, they're variable between the, the old state, the original state, and the new state. But that happened like, like that. And uh, geologically speaking, anyway, it didn't take long. It wasn't much change. It wasn't much change. It wasn't very complex. And bingo, it happened quickly, and then it became stable. And so hmm. for the next two or three million years, you get, you get the uh, New York kind running all the way down the Appalachians. 
And then you get the old kind, that's typical of the African and Spanish and German, basically, uh, ancestral kind, living happily uh, and, and not changing at all in the warm, shallow, sort of tropical coralline seas of the central part of the continent. And then the uh, sea level changed, probably because of plate tectonics. The only other way could have been a glaciation event that sucks up a lot of the water, drains the water. But anyway, the water disappeared in the inland seas for a period of time and uh, in the central part. And when it comes back, uh, that, that older kind that was there is not there. It's extinct, presumably. It's missing without a trace. I, you can't find it in the second half of the time uh, at all. And, uh, uh, and then so the trilobite that's out there is the one that had evolved in the east and was restricted to the east while the other one was still living there. Or at least that would be my interpretation. Of wow, that's an amazing al- amount of detail that you can get from for so so long ago from from looking at these fossils that's amazing yeah it just requires patience but it's it was thrilling to, to get these things and then when i finally saw what was going on and it made sense more with a geographic speciation concept that was coming back into vogue darwin had it when he was a kid he never published it because hmm. he couldn't see how the environment could be fragmented and new species appear geographically on the tops of continental surfaces. He didn't know about global climate change, in other words. Hmm. And he can't know about everything. So he, he thought it must be gradual because that's what natural selection, given the chance, would probably end up doing. And we knew life had evolved because we see all the diversity of life around us. So we went with his last best chance to explain um evolution and he got that part wrong even though he had seen it as a young man uh it's really interesting and and two guys uh one's a geneticist one was a uh, a bird evolutionary biologist ernst meyer was the they were both born one was born in, in russia that's dobjansky theodosius dobjansky was a geneticist mm-hmm. and ernst meyer and they both of them independently but they were both working in new york they knew each other so there must have been some uh, fertilization going on between the two of them. Basically resurrected, but developed an idea that, that new species arise geographically uh, in response to new environmental uh, situations that, that, uh, that they can adapt to through natural selection. So that idea was a generation uh, ahead of me. So I learned that along with the Darwin stuff. Although it had the, the ge- geography part had not penetrated into into the routine work of paleontologists, but I I knew about it. I was you know, and it was there, as, and and it was almost like a rescue operation for me because I couldn't find what I expected to see. I expected this gradual change through time, hmm. but it there was change. Finally found it, but it was herky jerky and it was geographic. A different environment laterally. And so this is what your theory of punctuated equilibrium is is trying to describe. Yeah, it's just geographic space the speciation plus the recognition and acknowledgement of this dominant pattern of stability mm-hmm. that you get. It's not anti-evolutionary, but things remain stable as long the env- as the environments remain stable. Because why mess with why mess with what works, basically, it would be the concept mm, there. That's key. So punctuated equilibrium, I always write on Twitter these days, is allopatric geographic speciation plus stasis. That's what we call this, this pattern, which is very common. Almost everything is stable for much of the of its history. Species have births. What, sorry, excuse my ignorance. Could, could you define one of your terms for me? Allopatric? Allopatric means different different places. So geographic. Okay, thank you. It means in different places. Al- Sympatric means in the same place. Allopatric means, but that's a that that's a jargonistic science word. But it it, it means geographic, geographic speciation. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're going to be sciencey, so I write on Twitter sometimes. Allopatric speciation plus stasis. Stasis is the word that we use out of the common lingo to characterize these periods of stability. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't recognized because people people thought it was anti-Darwinian because Darwin didn't talk about stasis, even though as a kid he knew darn well. 
about today. It's interesting. So uh, creationists or, or basically evolution, anti-evolutionists uh, pick up on these uh, discussions about how uh, evolution happens and, and how natural selection uh, adapts species. And, you know, they've repeated some of your statements in support of punctuated equilibrium regarding stasis in the fossil record to say that evolution doesn't happen. Um, you know, they point to this, it's evidence of special creation and, and kinds that don't ever change. Yeah, it's no, <laughs> it's no such, it's no such thing. This is not a rational argument. And we've, I've written, I wrote two books uh, on this subject, trying to make, present the, as you would put it, the rational view. Thank you. And the evidence for it. It's, it's a waste of time. It, it really is a waste of time to try to, there are, there have been some people out there with open minds who learned uh, the religious view, frankly, uh, when they were young and when they got to graduate school or went to college, whatever, they, um, they changed their minds because they were open to the evidence. But uh, th what's really going on here, I, I, I think it's, it, it's an early example in American writ large history um, because you, you guys actually, Canadians used to tease me because you didn't have this, this problem up in Canada. And I think you do actually, uh, now, but, uh, I used to get teased in, in the 1980s when, when I was going frothing at the mouth about, uh, about creationism. I think it's an example of what I'm, what I'm calling, uh, it's sort of a ident belief. I, it's an identity belief system. People are, you know, it's this, this is the same sort of thing as flat earth, which is even older, but also, I don't know, anti-vaccination conspiracy theories. These, these are, these are bonding themes. I don't, I just saw it today on Twitter or was it last night? Knowing I was going to be talking to you today, the guy says, uh, we didn't come from no monkeys and, uh, we didn't come from no big bang. <laughs> But it was all otherwise a political thing, hmm. you know. It was all about anti-intellectualism, anti the elitism of the of the intellectual uh, life, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and acknowledgement that actually knowledge is power. So that people who uh, are educated tend to um, have more sort of control over their lives or whatever i don't know they're not necessarily happier i'm not saying that but uh they are seen as the as the uh the ones with with all the power it's kind of ironic because uh it's anti-authoritarian uh when ronald reagan was talking about this he was a sort of a toying with the idea of supporting creationism mm. um uh yeah so uh anti-authoritarian you know Washington D.C. type power, so I find it ironic that it's now it's associated very much with authoritarian support of a, a authoritarianism of, of a different sort. Mm. It's funny how of things shift and, and change. So it's funny how things do shift and change. Absolutely. Yeah, interestingly, like your <clears throat> your theory came out uh, well before the what I would consider the revolution in in genetics. Um, associated with the Human Genome Project and, and the vast amount of knowledge that's coming out on, on DNA. How does how does discoveries how do discoveries in DNA and how DNA mutates through time? Because there's a lot of what they call stopwatches in like the non-coding DNA mutation buildup uh, that people can can time changes in the genome that have come up uh, through this study. How does this um, work with your punctuated equilibrium is, is it because is dna more gradual well that there is a gradualistic assumption in the molecular clock i don't know what the status of that is now i was more attuned with it maybe 20 years ago i've been retired for a while so i really although i'm working with some molecular geneticists you got to be careful with your assumptions with the molecular data it, it doesn't just tick like a clock i mean that was falsified at least at the level it was being investigated it Back in say the 1990s. Okay. Um, I don't know. I made a note to myself last night. Again, thinking about talking to you uh, 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 about this molecular clock idea, and I wonder what the status. In fact, I'm going to make another note because I'm I'm working with some <laughs> some molecular people uh, about this. Um, 
molecular clock, it doesn't all just tick. At least I was satisfied uh, that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the interesting thing about natural selection is Darwin had no clue why organisms resemble their parents. And what he said was particularly their grandparents. And uh, he said, but I know there is a natural process that accounts for it. And the sci scientifically, uh, scientists will eventually find out why, what the principles of heredity are and how it works. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, he saw that it did work somehow and was able to talk about the fate of that variation and that, that the heritable, uh, the heritable uh, variation um, uh, underlying the, the properties of organisms and, and oppose a theory about how, uh, why that can stay the same or, in his case, particularly change through time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's that, that basically is mouth is you you take the observed fact that there is whatever the details are a principle of natural process of heredity and there are far too many organisms born each generation could possibly survive uh and reproduce because of, of malthusian growth parameters and the limitations posed by the environment one of our big problems is we got rid of the Malthusian lid when we invented agriculture. Now we got eight billion people, and we don't know how to govern ourselves. But that's that's an exception to the general rule about what's been governing life. So he knew that that was the case, and so he could talk about natural selection, which is the ones best suited to the environment will tend to have more offspring, more babies, and their traits will be passed along differentially given the whole slew of variable things that are produced just willy-nilly by the reproductive process at any one time. has nothing to do with the details of how that works. When it came along, people would say, we did, people did say when they discovered the gene in around 1900, uh, we don't need Darwin anymore because now we understand it. No, it's at a different level entirely. You do need to know. You Now you know the origin of what the the ultimate origin of the variation, which is genetic mutation. You know what that is. You know a lot more details about, about that how process works. It does not bear on whether or not natural selection is a process in nature and how it works, because it's at a completely different level. It's at a population level, not the level of the individual or all of these genetic molecular processes hmm. go on. And this was seen and reconciled. Yeah, in 1980, I, it began a flow that has continued until up through last week, we're in a molecular geneticist, very well-meaning persons, almost always, and very enthusiastic people, come up to me and say, aha, I got the explanation for punctuated equilibria. And I said, oh, that's interesting. The first time that happened was a guy named Gabriel Dover, who's an early molecular geneticist in 1980, come up to me in, in Chicago at a meeting with a wild gleam in his eye. And he says, I got, I got the answer to your problems. I, I said, so what is it? And he says transposons. Well, I had heard of transposons. I still don't know in detail exactly how transposons work because I'm a paleontologist, not a geneticist. I don't deny that transposons are out there and doing all sorts of wacky things. <laughs> so I, but I, you know, uh, I said, I, I don't know, Gabriel, you might be right. But I, all I know is I, I, none of my data you know, bear on that that particular thing. I can't talk about processes that are internal to my body and your body and everybody else's body going on that's going to drive something that I see happening over uh, in space and in time. We're talking about, you know, thousands of miles and, and uh, uh, tens of millions, of, well, millions of years. Yeah. And I keep getting uh, suggestions like this about, I happen to be an environmental determinist. I just rediscovered that when I was 1963, I had a very formative experience as, a, as an undergraduate. I went to Brazil to do some anthropology, and I was uh, learned how to do anth anthropological fieldwork. Cultural anthropologists, not fossils, okay. although there were fossils where I was, and I was looking at the fossils too. But I was doing cultural anthropology, and I... Wrote a paper before I went down, and it was about environmental determinism in the Brazilian uh, fishing industry, because uh, I was about to go down there and try to figure out some some issues that previous people had had raised about the way 
people are fishing down there and why they're doing what they're doing and so forth and so on. So I, I learned, just relearned that, that I, that I am basically an environmental determinist. So I doubt very much, but this is because of what I see and because of my training and because of, I'm used to thinking this way, that most of the causal things that I should be looking at are outside of us. Most of what, everything we know comes from outside of us, but I'm talking about evolutionary things, mm -hmm, the environment, mm -hmm. in other words, so the environment writ large. Yeah, this is bearing on your, your criticism of gene centered theories of evolution uh, that, that you're talking about. You're, you're, it is. You're talking it about is. the, the sources of pressure that cause evolution are environmental rather than, um, rather than special random genetic things that might happen internally. Well, that, those go on, but then, they, then their fate is determined by the environment. Sometimes the actually the mutations are caused by the environment. I'm not even talking about that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about uh, you know this doesn't work anymore because it's the, the the climate is so much warmer. Things we see that the changes species migrate to more familiar type climes when the when the climate changes. That happens all the time, but they reach a breaking point where they can't go on. They can't just do this ad infinitum. And then things start dropping out. What used to work is no longer working. And if you can't change, that's not that easy to do evolutionarily to some other way of coping with the environment. You're going to go extinct. And that's really been the most species that have ever lived are extinct in the history of life. You get to these pinch points when the environment is changing and, and your right. adaptation for the previous environment doesn't work. And so now you basically end up with this choice between evolve or extinct. Is that is that basically how it is? No, uh, you can um, stay there and grin and bear it. Or you might, if you can, pick up and move, for example, a lot of our... Uh, our species down here are moving to Canada because uh, it's getting warmer up there. And uh, uh, so there's a change in the distributions of species. And and what people say, oh, you can't move a tree. Well, no, it's not the tree that moves, but their seeds move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, uh, botanical species can migrate almost as easily as bears and, and, and elephants can, can. Maybe not as quickly. And sometimes. Well, it depends on how they reproduce. I mean, if windblown pollen and and so forth, that there there could be some pretty quick changes in distributions of uh, of plants. As well, it depends on their reproductive biology. But uh, yeah, so that that would be the the next sort of favorite option. Uh, after grinning and bearing it, or getting out of dodge and moving to some place that with the habitat. Uh, that you're familiar with and adapted to is is already in place or is becoming more abundant, more common because it's getting warmer or it's getting colder or whatever the case may be. And if you don't have those options, the least likely thing to do would be to stay there and actually evolve because you that things don't really work that way. So you're sort of trapped and uh, basically you're going to end up going extinct. During the last ice ages that you guys sent us all those four times, those big glaciers uh, down, down here Sorry as far as south as Long Island. <laughs> yeah, well, it's all right. It's, it, wasn't your, it wasn't your fault, really. Um, uh, m there wasn't a heck of a lot of extinction until humans uh, came over to the New World and drove a lot of the mammals. I, I think people still argue about that, but I don't think there's any real question about mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. But most of the patterns you see was the movement of when, when the glaciers pulsed down, the boreal forest collapsed further south. And they, instead of being up in the Adirondacks and up in northern Minnesota and so forth and in Maine, and then in Canada, beautifully developed up there, the boreal forest, it collapsed down. And so maybe it was running through Kentucky at the worst or something uh, like that, south of the edge of the glacier. And then it would, not smoothly, but in patches and so forth, the boreal forest survived because it, it didn't just sit there and get run over by the ice advance. It moved. It moved south. Hmm. And, and similarly in the oceans, although a lot of the mollusks and the fish and all sorts of things moved up and down uh, according to the temperature regimes and, and what they were doing. So that is very common. And 
and it's something you have to sort out when you're looking at fossils from evolution because you get changes with habitat with things that are already adapted and they're moving so you got to sort that out and i saw a lot of that with my with my fossils but yes if it's if it goes too far and hits a critical point uh and there's no other place to go and it's species wide whole species will start dropping out and they'll do so rapidly and they'll do so at more or less the same time as other species in the ecosystems in which they're living and you get these turnovers Darwin knew about them because uh, somebody started writing in France about these turnovers. And he said, if species created in showers the world over, my theory false. Because he, he was laboring under this, this, this notion that things happen independently in all species and they adapt and they, they go through time. Just look at it. But whole ecosystems with entire species will exist and they'll go on for six or eight million years in the case of my stuff. And then many of them will go boom, extinct at the end. Some of them will get into the next interval and some of them, and some of them, the rest of them will go extinct. That's what happens. And they're replaced and they're replaced by things migrating in from elsewhere. And they're also replaced by spurts of evolution going on because global climate change is just the punchline of this. Global climate changes, changes the distribution of habitats and speciation can still go on even when extinction is going on, which is something that I didn't know until the mid-80s when Elizabeth Verber said that. But um, So if Darwin knew that, I wouldn't have had anything to do, and I would have maybe been a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but he left us something to do because he didn't see that. He didn't know about global climate change theory of glaciation was just being developed incidentally by an anti-evolutionary minded biologist louis agassi who came over to harvard but he was the one who invented uh, he was swiss and over there before he came to the new world he uh, he was uh studying glaciers in the alps and came up with this incontrovertible theory of glaciation this this is interesting so you know, it, it's very topical these days with climate change accelerating, and and you know, obviously we see the risk of significant habitat change, and people are afraid of ecosystem collapse, and there's a huge um, ex mass extinction effectively that going on because of this right now, and and some people will say, well, the climate's changed in the past, species adapt, this is all natural. This is not about climate change. This is about human destruction of the habitat. This has been going on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We didn't invent agriculture. We, we stepped outside of ecosystem and intensified what was already a bad situation. We were driving species extinct. We have changed the climate, and the climate is changing in a way that is accelerating the problem of mass extinction of organisms around the planet. It is not the beginning of it. It's not climate change. Climate change is part of the problem. It's a much worse than that. It's what the humans have been doing uh, ever since. Basically, we've had cognition and tools, and um, and and the habitat destruction that we've wreaked and continue to wreak. Mm -hmm. Look at this wonderful stuff that we're using, these little computers, and I'm talking to you and you're in Canada and it's real time and so forth. This is the positive side of what we've done. But my God, the 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 technology, particularly our technology, it's not malevolence either. I call it negligent Gaia side. It's just that we think the earth was created. There's another hangover from the Bible, really. For our use, and we were going out. We're going out there and mindlessly mining and and just transforming everything and taking everything that we need and competing with each other over it and, mm -hmm. and uh, making a huge uh, wreckage out of our planet. And it's going to kill us. Well, it will kill us. I do think, though, that we're going to we're going to end up. Uh, our societies will collapse under their own weight because we haven't figured out a way to manage uh, ourselves. I mean, we are dressed uh, chimpanzees. That's what we are. We're, we're the sense of, I mean, a wonderful, miraculous, I, I'm not, it's not miraculous, but it's, it's, it's an amazing 
thing, this rational thought that you're using in the title of your uh, of your podcast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This, this, we're aware that we're alive. We're aware that I'm aware that you're alive. You're aware that I'm alive. And we're aware that everything else is out there alive. We're aware that we're going to die, each one of us, someday. And uh, it's unlikely that there is any kind of cognition even really close to that amongst any other species of life on Earth, past or present, uh, certainly. And people think that it must be inevitable that it exists out elsewhere in the rest of the universe. I have no idea. I don't even think it's necessarily the case. So the mass extinction that we're experiencing now, um, human-caused, can you put it into perspective as a paleontologist? How does this stack up against other mass extinctions that the planet has experienced, and what followed those mass extinctions? Well, there was a rebound. Uh, the, the greatest one was at the end of the Permian. My uh, Steve Goulds and mine and other people's mentor, Norman Newell at the museum, was almost a lone voice in the wilderness calling about, out about the reality of mass extinctions in the mid part of the 20th century and when we were students. And the one he studied and knew the most about was at the end of the Permian, which is, what, 245 million years or so ago, and maybe he lost the figures run as high as the 96 or 97 percent of all the species on the face of the earth became extinct. Life almost went extinct. Maybe it wasn't quite that bad, but it was horrendous uh, what really happened. And it usually took, four, there were five or six of those naturally occurring global mass extinctions in the last half billion years since there were complex life uh, forms on earth. Mm-hmm. And uh, it takes usually, I don't know, it, uh, there are, it comes back in evolutionary, basically spurts, it's very punctuated, but it takes about 10 million years until you start getting ecosystems that look anywhere near normal, hmm. and the fossil record starts humming along again with a different cast of characters. And the greater the mass extinction, the, the more difference in the evolutionary products that are out there staffing the, the rebuilt new ecosystems. But on the other hand, it's the reinvention of the ecological wheel. I mean, you got rhinos, they look like triceratops and things like that. There are these things, these haunting similarities in an ecological sense. Yeah. Uh, and marine, marine and terrestrial vertebrate assemblages, ecosystems. So it takes, it takes a while. And the greater the mass extinction, the longer it takes. Mm-hmm. But you can take it all the way down if a volcano goes off and 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 kills off every living thing on on a pl- uh, on 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 an island. Uh, uh, what was that famous uh, Krakatoa? Ex- mm-hmm. ex- uh, people went when it was and and tried to sample life. It was nothing. It was barren. It was all gone. And then life came. So life was reestablished by immigration in of from populations that were not destroyed by the volcanic eruption as bad as it was so that's ecological reestablishment. but if you get to the level where entire species regional species typically they a species on average extends if it's terrestrial half a continent wide i mean basically you get the same birds in ottawa as you get uh, out to uh, out to the rocky mountains and then you start seeing different things hmm. basically so all right. So if, if you have something that affects an ecosystem that encompasses from Ottawa or Newfoundland, even all the way over to the uh, Rocky Mountain front, you're going to start knocking out entire and south down through Alabama in North America. You're going to start knocking out entire species. And, um, and, and as I say, when that happens, it tends to happen. It's not just, you know, American robins that go. It's it's robins and bluebirds and all sorts of things uh, uh, that will go at, at the same time. Hmm. Yeah. And now what? So those happen naturally, either by a, extraterrestrial impact or uh, other things, uh, supernovae uh, and, and, uh, and radiation events, so forth. Uh, the evidence is there, but it's hard to sift through it. And so the final word is not in on what caused all of these things. Sure. But the it's for darn sure that we're having a mass extinction right now, and we are the vector that's causing it. Mm-hmm. Not, as I said before, not not the climate change, which we are personally responsible for. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Would there have been another uh, advance of the glaciers? Because we just basically with uh, there were glaciers only 10,000 years ago when people were busy inventing agriculture in warmer climates. You still had ice in Ottawa. And uh, we did. We lost our ice. What? 12,000 years ago, maybe down here. And it melted back uh, Mm -hmm. and retreated north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would, would there have been another one? I don't know. Is it going to be another one? Not under the circumstances. But what I always tell people is you don't get the rebuilding, really, of life forms, either by migration or evolution, however it's going to happen, uh, unless and until the vector that's causing that change, like the smoke settles from the impact from the asteroid. Uh, This time we're the vector. So we have to either completely change what we're doing, lower our numbers and be much more careful about how we're treating things, or... Uh, we're going to drive everything, ex- uh, you know, we're, the, the mass extinction will go on as long as we're acting as badly as we have been uh, uh, and accelerating acting badly. Mm, indeed. The funny thing about global climate change is I thought that that would finally, people would see the sewers starting to slosh around their ankles, sort of metaphorically. People would wake up and see what we're doing to the planet. I didn't think it was a good thing, but I thought it would least wake everything up and then the climate scientists now are saying there you think you have trouble convincing uh people about covid (laughs) you know people still don't want to hear about global climate change even though the evidence is obvious I, i think that's one of the things you know that we've turned a corner on that the majority of people at least recognize as a problem and i think you know we've also turned the corner on creationism as uh, a majority again, I think we we've had some impact on on changing or educating somehow and communicating the importance of these things and and changing the the trajectory at least. Uh, it's a slow, a very slow process to change the trajectory of the, of our species. It seems right, and you got to remember it goes up and down. I'm really am cheered that we're no longer at the bottom of the list. Our USA. Of, of countries that I think only Bulgaria or someplace uh, was worse than we in, in rejecting the, the notion of evolution in the last uh, few decades. We, I think we've gotten a little bit better. I think you're right. There has been some progress made. I mean, it's astonishing, though, how many people still just... You know. <laughs> but as I say, it's not on the merits. It's, it's, uh, it's an identity belief. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. And I, the, and that reason shall prevail because reason um, is our only hope, really. Indeed, that's why I'm doing this, I, and I think we're getting towards the end of our time here. So I appreciate you coming on and chatting with me about this and, and sharing your views. Um, it's been enlightening, uh, and I hope uh, the listener out there also uh, has learned something from this. It's uh, really good. So. I'm going to send you a Rational View T-shirt so you can uh, you can represent uh, oh great for rationality as well. Thank you. <laughs> and I have one last question that I ask a lot of my contributors. Um, what what type of science fiction do you like? Do you have a, a favorite author or a favorite? Uh... I'm really not much of a actually a reader even uh, these days. I and TV movies. No, I don't. I, Basically, my favorite science fiction book was written many years ago. It's called Orn, and it was about a different kind of rationality. It was held by a bird, and it's phylogenetic memory rather than based on uh, learning things and, and deducing things. Uh, but cool. also a uh, so Orn, it, it, it's sort of the, the these huge diatrima is one of the names Eocene birds that are as big as ostriches with these enormous beaks. Uh, I think some of the scariest looking animals I've ever seen in my life. We have a tremendously uh, complete, beautiful skeleton of one of these things at at the American Museum of Natural History. But according to this book, I can't remember who wrote it. It was uh, uh, phylogenetic memory that was these birds were able to act on and be as successful and in many ways as smart as we think we are. So. Ah, cool. Very neat. Yeah. So thanks so much for, for coming and chatting with me. I appreciate talking to you. Uh, it was a pleasure, and I'm glad you're doing this. We need more rationality and less irrationality as this world stumbles on. 
If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patreon.podbean.com slash The Rational View. Thanks for listening.